All right, so as we're nearing the end of the second week here, I just again want to remind you of the Gantt chart that I've been following. Hopefully you've been following along with this or you've chosen to use your own self uh, organization tool of some sort to make sure that you're staying on track. Uh, today, uh, at least according to the Gantt chart that I proposed, uh, you should be starting on your first rough draft of those three programs. Uh, and at least, you know, doing the basics of uh, today we're going to cover file IO, but like opening up a file or reading in the command line arguments or something like that. Uh, and you should have a first rough draft of this so that you can work on it for the rest of the week next week before it's due. Uh, remember that we are online. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and post to Piazza or to the uh, YouTube live stream here. Uh, but otherwise, uh, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. Uh, we were uh, doing this isotope uh, exercise, uh, and we left off by defining our own method here to get the mass that after, uh, after a certain number, of, with an initial mass here, after a certain number of years given a half-life, we use that formula in the handout to determine how much mass would actually be left. Uh, we also put this, uh, uh, this uh, you know, constant uh, into a constant up here, right? Uh, and then we left off by not doing any documentation here. So what I want to do now is I want to add some documentation to this method because it's a non-trivial method. The main method is a trivial method because everybody knows what the hell main does, right? It runs. Uh, but what does this get mass, uh, you know, uh, method do? Uh, it, uh, this method, this method, or you don't really have to, you know, start out with this method every single time, but it computes the, ma uh, the uh, mass after the given number of years, starting with the initial mass. And I'm going to go ahead and use some kind of HTML uh, style stuff here, uh, given the initial mass, and then I'll end it right here. It's okay if you don't know HTML. You don't even have to do it like this. You do have to document all of your methods, though, but you don't have to use this strict doc style, Java doc style commenting. Uh, but it computes the mass after a given number of years, and I'll go ahead and codize that as well. All right, there we go. Uh, after uh, starting with an initial mass uh, uh, of uh, a radioactive element with the given half-life, and I'll code that too. Now, why do I surround these with HTML code tags? Because when you go to read the documentation, and unfortunately I'm not gonna be able to zoom in here, but you'll see that they, are, they have been marked up, they have been uh, formatted uh, using a monotype font indicating that they are part of the code, right? Uh, you can take that further. For example, if you want to point somebody to external documentation on what's a half-life again, right? So uh, radioactive half-life Wikipedia, right? We'll just go ahead and pull up the Wikipedia page on this uh, and we'll link to it, right? For more information, see a href equals this, uh, Wikipedia, there we go. And when I format this, you can see that it is going to be linkable, right? Maybe, uh, oh, I must, I must have done that here last time, oh well. Uh, it's okay to duplicate that documentation. Anyway, now that we're done with that, with that uh, method, by the way, we haven't tested that method, have we? Uh, if we were going to do this in a more formal manner, what would I do? I would design my own J unit tests. I would have at least five test cases where I've got some input and uh, expected output, and I would write those J unit tests and I would put them into a testing file, uh, and I would run that over and over again to make sure that it works before I move on to the rest of it. We're not going to require a formal unit testing framework like J, uh, like J unit in this class, uh, but it is something you should be thinking about doing. Right? Now, you'll definitely have to write your own test cases as far as homework one goes and going forward. In fact, turning them in early so that we can use them to grade everybody else is worth bonus in the project itself. Right? All right, so let's go ahead and convert those command line arguments. Remember that the first one is an atomic number. What kind of variable should that be? Is there an atomic, uh, are atomic numbers integers, doubles? What are they? They're integers, so atomic number, right? And what is that argv, or not argv sub zero, right? It's args 
So, and it will be the first one is always at zero in Java. In C, the first one argv sub zero, that is the executable file name. If it's a scripting language, it's usually the script name. Uh, but in Java, it's different because it doesn't have that first one uh, because you name the class, you should know what it's called, right? So args sub zero. Now, is this going to work? Args is an array of strings. I'm expecting an integer. How do I convert that? Integer dot parse int. Oops, args sub zero. There we go. Uh, strong TM90 here, that would be a string. So we can go ahead and ignore that and use args as of one if we wanted to, but I like to put that into a sensible variable name here. So str uh, string uh, a t uh, name maybe is equal to args sub one. Do I have to worry about making a deep copy of this string and doing all the memory management? No, because it's Java. Great. Uh, now, the, the next one is going to be the symbol. Right. That's arg sub 2. Right. Uh, and then the next one will be the half-life, which is going to be what kind of variable if it's a 28.9 double. Right. Half-life is equal to... Uh, now, in this case, I'll, it'll be a double dot parse double. Uh, arg sub 3. There we go. And remember, we already did our error checking up here. All right, if there aren't five arguments, then we'll go ahead and error out uh, and uh, exit. But uh, the last one here will be uh, the initial mass. Now, I wrote this as an example with 10 kilograms or 10 grams, whatever, whatever you want to interpret that as. Um, is it always going to be a whole number? No, you can have a half a gram or something, right? So uh, double uh, mass. In fact, I'm going to call it initial mass. Because I'm starting out with it. Remember what we're doing? We're producing this decay table. Initial mass is going to be 10 grams or 10 kilograms, whatever. Uh, and then I'm going to update that. I may want to keep this original value here because I want to know how, after how many years, uh, you know, it, it updates. Okay. So the initial mass here is going to be another double, dot parse double, args sub four. I've got all my arguments now. So... How do I go about producing this table? Well, the header, right? I could go ahead and copy pasta that. Right? It's dangerous to copy pasta out of a PDF. Why? Are these necessarily uh, hyphens? Nope. Uh, so, but we'll go ahead and fix it if we need to. Uh, so system.out.println, oops. Yeah, yeah, .println. So I want to print, what was it? Strong TM90, in other words, its name. And then in parentheses, I wanted to print its atomic number and then its uh, symbol. Right? So instead of printf, if I want that kind of formatting, right, let me go ahead and use printf. And that will be, say, a couple spaces over here. Formatting a string is percent %s. Right? And then you can put something in parentheses here. Uh, and in that parentheses, I'm going to put something that is an integer, followed by a hyphen, and then followed by something that is another string. So how do I get an integer here? Percent %d hyphen percent %s, and I will end up printing the name, the, uh, the what is it, atomic number, and its symbol. There we go. That's the first one. It's the first line system.out.print. I could go with print ln here, uh, elapsed years, years amount, or I could also format these, right? So percent %s, percent %s, maybe tab over, percent %s, end the line. I forgot to end the line up here. There we go. Uh, and then I can give just as strings, I don't need to store them off in a variable. I can go with elapsed years and then amount. And that allows me to adjust things if I really wanted to. Right? Uh, for this, this one, I'm just going to go ahead and system.out.println. Come on. The exact amount is before. Right? I mean, again, in general, formatting is not going to matter on the grader as long as it is readable. 
if you wanted to make this some fancy ASCII text, like alternating, something like that, and I screwed up already, but whatever, right? Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it like that. If you want to get really, really fancy with your, uh, with your formatting and make some nice ASCII art, uh, go ahead. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't need to match our, uh, our formatting, okay? Let's go ahead and run this to see if it's actually working so far. Right? Uh, and remember that we need to provide these as command line arguments. How do I do that in, in uh, Eclipse? A run configuration. And for that, uh, actually, I'm going to steal this. I'm just going to copy pasta this. Uh, and run configuration. Go up to the arguments. All those are arguments. Apply and run. Right? Strong TM90, 38, SR and then the rest of that stuff. Now, for the rest of this, how should I go about doing it? So in the first year, I could hard code that, right? Uh, you, you haven't, there haven't been elapsed years yet, or I could go ahead and use a zero or something like that, right? Uh, and then I'm going to want to you know, tab over a certain number of uh, characters here and then print out the current mass. So if I were to do that with the initial mass, what would it look like? System.out.printf. Uh, maybe I will go ahead and print it as zero because it's zero elapsed years. Uh, and then tab over uh, and uh, percent. Uh, how do I format a double? F. And, oh, well, you were only doing it to, out to two decimals of accuracy. It's OK to print more decimals of accuracy, more sig figs. Now, if it's dollars, of course, you don't want to print fractions of a cent or something like that. Uh, but it's OK to use the default. The default here is going to be six decimals of accuracy. OK? And then followed by the end line here. And I would print out, say, zero, because it's zero elapsed years so far, and the initial mass. All right? Let's see what this looks like. Zero and then 10. If you want to add like kilograms, I think it was grams in the handout. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I'll go ahead and label it as grams, though. Right. You can go ahead and you, you don't have to put a space there. Uh, and it looks something like this. Right. Then you can go back and adjust your format, go, go left or right or something like that. Doesn't really matter. OK. Uh, well, after one year, it would be what? One year of elapsed time and no longer the initial mass. Instead, it would be what mass? Well, that's why I wrote this function. Get the mass, double, new mass, <laughs> by calling that mass. And then what were the arguments? Mass, year, and half-life. So mass, initial mass. Years would be one year later. And the half-life would be the half-life that we read in from the command line arguments. And so the new mass would be printed right here. Now, is that going to truck with our handout here? Nine, seven, six, and then a bunch of other stuff. Nine, seven, six, it looks good so far. Continue, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. What should I be using here? Probably some sort of a for loop here, right? So let's go ahead and design our for loop. For, why, why, why did you say for loop, by the way? Who said it? All right, why for? Yeah. A do while loop? Huh? Or a while loop? What are we going to do? We're going to do this for as many years as it takes until we get down to half of the original. Now, the half life will tell you that, right? The half life here was 89 or 28.9 years. So all you had to do is go up to the next integer and do it for that many years. So you could do it that way, right? Uh, how would you go about doing that? If I have a half-life in this variable here, how do I get the next integer larger than it? Int uh, n, let's say. How do I go up? How do I, 28.9, I want that to be 30. What's that called? That's called rounding, right? Math.round will take a half-life here. Uh, it will take a, a floating point number, uh, and it will round it up to the next e nearest integer. However, it's complaining about this. What does it say? Type mismatch. Cannot convert from long to int. Right? 
So let's go ahead and go to round and see what its return type is. This is the actual math library here. This is the actual math code here. Uh, how does it do its stuff? Wow, that looks complicated, right? So don't roll your own round function. That's the, that's the, that's the lesson there, right? Uh, so it's, it's returning a long. How can we force it to become an integer? Truncation, right? Now, you might have cause to use a long. If you want to, you can use a long. That's a 64-bit two's complement signed integer. So you can express quite a bit larger numbers than 2.147 billion. For this, for this particular application, though, we're not going to have to worry about that. It does not return a floating point number. It just returns a really, really large, potentially large uh, integer. I'm forcing it to become a smaller integer by assuming that it's less than 2.147 billion. If it's greater than 2.147 billion, and I try to fit it into a box that only holds 2.147 billion, then I'm going to have uh, uh, you know, uh, overflow issues. Right? And I'm not going to get the result that I want. But that's good enough. So now we can go ahead and write a for loop. For int i equals 0, i is less than n i plus uh, plus. We'll go ahead and print it out, and then get, uh, uh, I guess, just get the new mass here. I don't want to have to tab twice. What could I do? Shift, command for Mac. Shift, command, F, and everything is nicely formatted automatically. Right. Uh, so the new mass here will be to get the mass, but after not one year, but after I years. Right. Uh, and after I years, you have this new mass. Right. So let's run this again and see if it works. We were off. Now, 10, uh, 9.76, blah, blah, blah. Let's just spot check this. At year 10, we should have uh, 787, looks like. Oh, okay. I guess I didn't include that. So three should be uh, 930. 930. Okay, it looks good to me so far. But where is the last year that we did this? 28. Do we have less than what we originally had? We started out with 10. We wanted to get down below five. So why didn't we go all the way? Was our rounding wrong? No, our rounding was right. Our for loop was wrong. Uh, an idiomatic for loop starts out at zero and goes up to, but not including n, because that's how you operate on arrays. We're not operating on an array here. We're operating on a number. So go up to and include that 30th or 29th year in this case. Run it again. 4988, which does match the handout because printf generally rounds. Uh, but since we're printing more sig figs here, uh, it, it, that's probably correct. Right. So is one test case enough? No. Nope. Is two test cases enough? No, but that's all we're requiring of you. Right. All right, that looks good. Of course, you'd want to pull out your chemistry textbook or whatever and find out some other half-lives, plutonium or uranium or something like that. You'll want to find something with a reasonably small half-life to do this uh, because you don't want, you know, like uranium-235, I think, has billions of years of half-life or something. And you don't, you don't want to sit there and, and do billions of calculations yourself. All right. Uh, but otherwise, that looks pretty good. Okay. Anything else I need to do before I turn this in for a grade? Get rid of superfluous cruft, right? The stuff that should not be in there. You might want to go back and you know tweak your uh, outputs if you want to. Make sure everything is done and functional before you start doing the uh, uh, the juice or whatever you want to call it. That's a that's a term that I picked up from game programming, right? If you just have a simple game, right? Eh, it's boring. It's when you add the little tweaks to it. Uh, that uh, that's called the juice, right? You juice it up and make it look good, and that 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 improves the use the player's experience. All right, all right. So, to review what we did, we introduced without uh, talking about it uh, methods in Java. Right? In Java, methods or uh, functions are called methods. There we go. I can zoom in if you want. There we go. All right. Uh, don't worry about the technical 
a, a technical difference between what a function and a method is. Just remember that uh, uh, methods must be defined within a class. Right? For now, all our methods will be static methods. They will belong to the class. Right? It is either necessary or best practice to access or call those methods using the dot operator. So for example, when I called that math function, math.pow or math.e or something like that, I referred to the class, then the dot, and then the name, say square root in this case. Right? And now in this case, I didn't need to do it in the example that we put together. Why? Because I was already in the class. So when, it, when, it, when I said, go ahead and get the mass, it knew, oh, well, you must be talking about this class because you didn't qualify what you meant. So it was able to deduce that you probably meant this function up here, this method up here. Nevertheless, even in uh, isotope, there we go, even within your own class, if you're going to access a static me method, you should still use the class name. Because what happens if you bring in another class with the same method name? Right? It's not a conflict, it's just that now you need to disambiguate it. Or uh, other rules will take over and by default it'll use the, 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 uh, the class that you're in, that method, instead of the other method that you intend. Right. So even though it, it, it's just best practice to get into that habit. So isotope dot uh, get mass, right. et cetera. Uh, for now, all of our methods will be public, right? Uh, this refers to the visibility. The visibility keyword, keywords are public, right? Any other piece of code can see and thus call that method. Right? Uh, alternatives that we'll, we'll eventually get to would be private, uh, only the class can see the method, right? Or uh, protected, right? And this one, I, I put it last because um, uh, it gets into inheritance and object-oriented programming. We'll get into that in a couple of weeks, right? Protected means that the class and its subclasses can see it, right? And I don't even know how to do this, but uh, no, uh, no keyword, right? If you leave off the keyword entirely, if you do, uh, let, let me show you what it lo would look like. Uh, instead of making it public, if I just did something like this, that's perfectly valid Java. What happens is it becomes package protected. Uh, remember that we organize our uh, classes into packages. In this particular case, our package was unl.cse. All of the other classes inside that package can now see that, uh, where was I? There we go. Can see that uh, function or see that method, okay? Uh, so we're just gonna make this public. Why? Well, there's no problem with anybody using and seeing this method. Right? If you made it private, then no other class could see it except for this class. Imagine a math library where everything was private. You couldn't call any square root function at all, right? Uh, so if you've, got, uh, if you've got static functionality, if you've got static methods, just go ahead and make them public for now. Uh, no keyword means that it is package protected and any class in the same package can see it. Uh, otherwise, then you've got the, you also specify a return type, right? the type of variable, the function or the method returns. Right? And you do have to have a return statement. If non-void, on void, you must return a value. For, so for example, over here, if I didn't have this return statement, then the compiler would let me know about it. Right? In C, uh, the compiler might give you a warning, but it would be perfectly fine to leave off the return statement. Uh, so uh, usually, I think. Uh, but, in the end, uh, but then these arcane rules of what happens when you do that start to take over uh, and then you get garbage results. That, uh, but here, the compiler is smart enough to say, nope, you can't do that. That's part of the rules now.
All right, you must return a value. And you use the keyword uh, return. Right. Uh, for void functions, that is, or void methods, uh, if you aren't returning anything at all, you should still use a return, but you return nothing statement. It's just a good idea to get into that practice. Okay. All, all non-trivial methods need documentation. Right. Just get into that habit. Get into the habit of writing doc style comments. Uh, you'll, because it generates them for you, right? It generates the formatting for you and you don't have to type as much. Okay. All right, questions so far? No questions online. So let's go ahead and go back to the demonstration here. And let's talk about the next item, file IO. Right. So let's do some file input, first of all. Now there are a couple of dozen ways of doing file input and file output. Don't worry about the myriad of ways that you can do this. I'm going to show you the easiest way, and then I'm going to show you an e easier way, right? It's even easier than the easy way. Right. So let's go ahead and read in a file and process it line by line, because this is the most common thing that you do, okay? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what's called a scanner. A scanner scans thing, things. A scanner could scan the, uh, the standard input, and so it could actually read from the keyboard. I'm going to go ahead and omit that here because you'll, you won't have any need to read from the keyboard. You'll be reading command line arguments for everything. Uh, but anyway, I need to specify what this scanner is scanning. Uh, new scanner, right? and I'm going to give it a new file. Right? And within that file, I provide the file name and its, uh, and its uh, 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 path. So if I wanted to go all the way up to the top of the file system and work down, I would start with a, back, uh, with a forward slash here. And I don't know, uh, Etsy password. What do you think that file is on a Unix flavored system? It's the password file, but passwords aren't actually stored in that. Right? Uh, I need to, uh, of course, import all of these things. So let me go ahead and import file and import scanner. And once I do that, a different issue will pop up here, but we'll take care of that in a second. Uh, if I wanted to open up a file within my own project, then I would say file.txt. But do you see a file, file.txt over here anywhere? Nope. So everything is relative in a project to, not to the source file, uh, but to the root of the project up here. So it's best practice, especially if you are uh, using Eclipse, so you're gonna want to do this, is to establish a new folder in which to put uh, your input and output fi uh, files. Right? I'll just call it, say, data, because it's gonna hold data, it's gonna store data, whatever. And in there, you can put in a new file, a new file, uh, file.txt. Right, there we go. Hello, world, how blank line are you? 10, right? Or something like that. Right. I just need some data to process here, okay? Now, the other issue with this is that what happens when that file doesn't exist? What if I were to say misspell file? Uh, Y'all? All right, there we go. All right. I don't know if that's a word or not, but. So what, what would happen in say C? If you tried to open a file for reading that didn't exist, what would it do? Return. You can't do that because it doesn't exist, so it would return a null pointer. In this case, however, we have to use, uh, in, in Java we uh, do uh, uh, error handling differently. We'll talk about this after we've talked about uh, file IO, but basically it's exception based. If an error happens, a, this, this thing called an exception is thrown. It's an interruption of the normal control flow of, the, uh, of your code. Uh, and then you can choose to uh, down here catch the exception because it was thrown at you. You can catch it and then handle it and decide what to do. It's in contrast to say C where you call a function and it returns an error code, zero for no error, one for an error of type one, two for an error of type two, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but most modern programming languages have a, an exception handling system. So I'm going to go ahead and take its advice and surround it with what's called a try catch. Go ahead and try this potentially dangerous code. If something happens like the file was not found, 
then go to this, play, uh, this, this chunk of code and decide how to handle it here. Right? For now, we're just going to print the stack trace and die, or, or actually move, move on. So let me go ahead and try to open this file that doesn't exist. Remember, F-I-A-L-E, or a, a file, or however you want to pronounce that, does not exist. So let's go ahead and open that up. Oh, OK, no such file. All right, I misspelled it, right? File. Is it going to work now? Still not. Why? File is expected to be in the same directory, in other words, the UNL CSE directory, or in the source directory, or whatever, as this code right here. It's not. Where is it? It's in the data directory. So I will go ahead and open up data slash file. Right? And this should work. No exceptions here. Of course, I'm not doing anything yet. All right. All right, we'll talk about how to deal with this a little bit more elegantly here in a moment. But otherwise, I've opened up the file, and now I need to read it in line by line. If I go s dot, it'll show me what the functionality of a scanner I have available to me. For example, I can get the, uh, I can check whether or not it has a big decimal, or a big decimal, something more familiar here. Is there a next Boolean, has next Boolean? Is there a has next line? Is the, or am I at this end of the file? Does it have uh, uh, the next integer or the next double here? Right? Again, it's kind of hard to see, and I can't uh, zoom in on it uh, you know, uh, easily here. Uh, I can go ahead and get the next integer, or the next double, or the next float, or the next line. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and get the next line, dot next line. Or line right? And I'm going to store that into a string, line is equal to, oh, come on. And now for processing, whatever you were going to do with that line, you do it here. Uh, if it was a CSV data, well, then you would split it up. And what was that function to do that? What did I just call it? You split it up. You split that uh, string up into tokens. Uh, or if you just wanted to print it out, then that's what we're going to do. System.out.println line. There we go. Let me go ahead and execute this. How many lines is this actually going to read? Just one, right? Hello world. Why? You don't see a loop there, right? It's not going, OK, give me the next line, and then the next line, and then the next line. All it's doing is the first line here. Uh, now, in C, if you open a file, you process it, what's the third and final step? You close it. So s.close. Right? You don't close the file that you created. Because the file that you create is just a, an object. It's actually just a reference to the file. It's not actually open. It's the scanner that actually opens it. And therefore, you close the scanner. All right. There's another way of doing this. I'll show you later, though. But otherwise, what I want to do is I want to read every line. I want to read the first line, and then the second line, and then the third line, etc. So what should I do? A loop, right? What kind of a loop? For loop or while loop? Which is more appropriate? While? OK. While s dot has next line, right? While it has a line, that's just returning true or false. If you were to call next line, and I were to give you a line, then I'm saying true. There is another line to read, right? And I'll go ahead and move that up into this loop, so that while you still have a line to read, go ahead and read it, print it out, process it, whatever you're going to do with it. And now I get all of those. Hello, how are you? Ten at the end. Now, in some formatting, especially in your project, we specify that the first line is actually the number of records that you want to, to read. So I don't know, th four. Right? How would you go about doing something like this? Read the first line, convert it into an integer, right? and then uh, only read that many lines afterwards. In other words, I would switch over from a while loop into a for loop because it tells me exactly how many I need to do. Right? OK, I'll la leave that as an exercise, though. Uh, once you've closed it, you're good to go. Now, there's another more modern way of doing this. If you've only got one, a, a file as a resource. If you've opened up a resource, you need to clean up after yourself. Now, memory is a resource too, but in Java, you don't have to clean up after yourself with Java with memory because no memory management. But a file is a, still a resource, and in Java, it's not going to close it automatically unless you call this. But we can force Java to close it automatically if we use the following syntax, 
try, and this is a try with resources. I'm going to go ahead and add some extra lines around this thing. All right. So by putting the, uh, this is special syntax that was introduced in Java 7 or 8 or 9 or something like that, uh, where you can say that this openable resource, this file that I want to open, I'm going to go ahead and initialize that, in particular the scanner here. I'm going to initialize that in this try statement. Uh, and then this is no longer necessary, closing it. It will close it automatically for me. So by simply moving a line up, I can remove one line down here. <laughs> it's not that big of a savings, right? But syntactically, if you want to use this instead, it'll work. Right? And same result as before, okay? All right, I will put this into the notes so that you have it, and then I'm going to get rid of it. That's the easy way. Uh, let's go file IO. So file input. There we go. But I will show you the even easier way. So there is a one-liner. In fact, a couple of one-liners if you really want to. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and cut and paste it over here. All right. There. So if you, uh, in Java 6, 7 or not 8 or 9 or something like that, they introduced this java.nio.file. Uh, NIO stands for non-blocking input output. So they've introduced a new library here uh, and paths is part of the same library as well, where, whereby you can go ahead and data dot, or data slash, what was it, file.txt, open it all up, read the entire thing in as one big giant string and then give it to you. Right? So here's the entire contents of the file. Right? And system.out.println ln contents. There we go. All right. Surround that with a try uh, with a try catch uh, as well, because of course you could have a file, uh, an input output exception here for whatever reason. I'm going to go ahead and move this back up here. So there's a one liner. All right. Cool. All right. No loop at all. Now, if you do need a loop and you need to go line by line because you want to process them, uh, that's fine too. What you could do is get a list of strings, lines, right? If you want each one a line, but split out, well, you could do that here anyway with contents. You could split that based on the end line character because of course it is printing out the end line character, it preserves those. Uh, but if you want this all in one line, here's another one liner uh, that might be useful. Uh, here we go, yep. Files, same files as before the NIO uh, uh, files of uh, the library, the non-blocking input output library. Uh, read all of the lines from this particular file. All right, uh, and then you, uh, this is this might be necessary. Yeah, this is necessary. Um, I'll explain this in, here in a second. Actually, we we talked about UTF, right? Uh, Unicode characters, right? The ASCII text values only go from zero to one hundred and twenty-seven. They were created a long, long time ago, right? Uh, before, uh, uh, yeah, with the advent of modern computing, I think in the 50s, maybe even the late 40s, I'm not sure. Uh, it was, uh, uh, who was after FDR? Truman, I think it was the Truman administration that said, we need to standardize this stuff. And so they created the ASCII text table. But because it was old, right? It was the American standard character interchange, whatever, whatever. Uh, well, obviously, English is not the only language, right? Uh, and so we've extended that over the years, and we've got CJK fonts, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean fonts. We've got uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? We, now, today, we have emojis that are all part of the Unicode system. UTF-8 is the standard. UTF-8 is Unicode. Uh, I, I forget what the TF stands for, but uh, this is basically Unicode. I'm saying open up this file and treat it as Unicode. Uh, why? You could open up a file and treat it as binary data, right? You can open up a file and treat it as a different type of data. Uh, strip out all the Unicode. I'm expecting this to only be ASCII text. What are my other options here, by the way? Uh, ISO 8859, that's a different uh, uh, standard. UTF-16, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you're safe with UTF-8, though, right? Unicode, basic Unicode. Uh, and then you could go ahead and print this stuff out. System.out.println lines. Right? So a one-liner to do every single line 
but as a list of strings. At this point, I want to correct uh, an error I made, oh, not an error, but a gotcha that I made last time. Uh, somebody had asked, how do you convert a, an array to strings? And so, for example, the arg args here. How can you convert this array of strings to, say, a list of strings? Uh, arguments. Right? And I say, I think I did something like lists or list.of args. This will work, but it won't work in the way that you expect it. This will end up being an immutable list. Right? So let me go ahead and try to add something to it. Arguments.add foo. Right? Now, when I run this, it's actually going to throw an exception, I believe. Yep. Unsupported operation exception on line 23. You can't add foo to this. It's an immutable list. We've heard that word before when we were talking about strings. Strings are immutable. Once you create them, you cannot change them. This is an immutable, uh, this of, if you read, if I'd read the documentation uh, closer, it returns an unmodifiable list. You can't add stuff to it. You can't take stuff out of it. So if, if, if that's your use case, if that's what you want to use it for, that's perfectly fine to use something like this. Right? Otherwise, the better way, if you want a mutable version, list of strings, mutable arguments, right? it's going to be arrays dot, uh, is it arrays? It's not as list, to list, no, come on, dot, what is it? I forgot. I should have, I should have reminded myself off the top of my head here. Uh, Darn it. Oh, well. Oh, two, not two string. Fill, parallel, blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, arrays. I thought it was arrays. Array dot. Two lit. Nope. All right. I'm going to go ahead and write null for now and then come back to it. All right. But anyway, I wanted to correct it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you can, again, you can still use it if you want to. It's just going to be an unmodifiable list. Okay. All right. I'll put this into the notes so that you have it as well. Now, file input, what about file output? Right. Again, I'm only going to show you the easiest way of doing this by using a print, what's called a print writer. So I'm going to go ahead and create a print writer. PW equals new print writer. And then you provided a file just like you provided a, the scanner a file, a new file. Uh, data dot out or output dot txt. All right, so does that file exist there? No, but we're doing this for writing, right? So does it need to exist if I'm just going to write to it? No, it'll automatically create it for me, assuming that I have permission to do so. And that's why it's giving me a compiler error here because you still need to surround it with a try catch. Go ahead and try this. If now it's weird because if you don't have permission to create that file, it can't create it. Therefore, the file is not found, right? That's the kind of exception it you get, you, that gets thrown here, right? Uh, but if you do have permission to create the file, you can go ahead and uh, open it. Uh, let me go ahead and run this. Oops, uh, compiler error, really? Oh, there, save, I, I had to save it. All right, there we go. It ran, but did you see a file created? Nope. What's one thing I forgot to do? PW dot close, right? If you open up a file, process it, either for reading or writing, it doesn't matter. The third step is always to close the file. Let me do it again, and it's probably still not gonna work, but for different reasons, right? It actually did work. It's just not showing up here. Some IDEs need to be forced to sync with the file system. So if I go over here and refresh this, it magically appears. It was there the whole time. It's just that my, uh, the, the ID here, the um, uh, Eclipse, was not checking every single second. Is there a new file there? Nope, okay. Oh, there is a new file there. Okay, I'll go ahead and refresh my, uh, my display over here. Right? Uh, sometimes you have to force it to refresh the display. And I, now that I have forced it to refresh the display, I see that there's a file, but is there anything in it? No. So why is this the easiest way of doing something? Because guess what? What else is a print writer? System.out. So every system.out dot functionality that we've covered so far 
copy paste your knowledge here pw dot println hello world pw dot print no end line right. pw dot print f uh, percent s percent d and the line uh, and then hello or goodbye and just a number 42 say all right so print ln print print f copy paste all that knowledge and you get a print writer here and refreshed it you see goodbye 42 no inline character there because i used print etc all right what happens if i change this what happens if i say uh hello world three times and I'll go ahead and get rid of this. What will happen to the content of this file? It'll be completely overwritten, right? When you open it up, you open it up for writing at the start of the file. So if you want to open it up for appending or something like that, then you, you, need, a more you need a more sophisticated solution, right? But whatever contents of the file were, they're gone. That's why you never open up source files, right? So, uh, source UNL CSE demo dot Java copy <laughs> run oh okay no it's not dot sorry <laughs> copy run there we go and oh it preserved it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> right. That's why I copied it. Okay. So be careful. You will overwrite it and it will not ask you to undo. There is no undo. Uh, actually, there is an undo. Let me show you. All right. You know, yesterday I was working on this file and there was an essential piece of code that I didn't do, and I was, I was dumb and I didn't use GitHub, right? I didn't commit my work, push my work, and have a nice uh, backup copy on, on, on github.com. That's okay. I can go ahead and compare, uh, now I've got to look at this. Compare with local history. Whether or not you use GitHub, Sometimes, cross your fingers, Eclipse will keep a local history of the files that you've been working on. I say cross your fingers and because you are rolling the dice if you re rely on this, all right? But I can go ahead and look at the local history. Uh, let's see, what is uh, from Tuesday? Tuesday at 11.20. Uh, the thing on the right-hand side is what we were working on. There's Chris, Joe, Jane, all the way down to Daryl and Daryl, right? And then I can go ahead and select it all copy, and now I've got it preserved somewhere, right? Thank your lucky stars if this works and you ever actually need it, right? You won the lottery. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're not properly using GitHub, if you're not properly uh, backing up your code, you are rolling the dice, right? So make sure that you are using GitHub, right? Okay. I had a student many years ago, I had a student come to me, I, I, I donked my homework. Uh, I had it 100% working, and then I accidentally deleted the file. I go, oh, well, uh, I guess it's a zero. Or show me your Eclipse. And I showed him this feature, uh, and it was there. Right? And, oh, thank God. Right. All right, so save yourself from yourself by doing proper Git uh, and repository management. Right. Okay, so there is an undelete. <laughs> All right, so error handling. Java supports exceptions. It doesn't support, uh, I mean, you can do it if you want to, but you can return true or false. There was an error. There was not an error. You could return an error code if you want, just like C. But the more elegant solution, the more modern solution is to use a proper exception handling system. Uh, an exception, exception, is an interruption of the normal flow of control. How do you spell inter uh, interruption? Two R's? There we go, apparently. Uh, so what you can do is you can surround a potentially dangerous uh, piece of code 
or uh, with a try catch block. And we just saw this, right? In fact, it, it auto generated that try. Try this dangerous thing. It's okay. If you fall, if it ends up as an error or an exception, we will catch you before you've fallen off the edge of the cliff, or you have fallen off the edge of the cliff. But we're catching you and we're putting you back up onto the cliff and saying, all right, how do you want to handle this situation here? You, uh, in, in C, I usually uh, use the, 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 the metaphor of looking before you leap. If you're about to take another step and there, uh, you're on a precipice, if you're on the edge of a cliff, right, you look before you take that step. And if you're about to step off the cliff, you don't do that dangerous operation. Instead, you do something else. Right? But exception handling is different. It says, go ahead and go ahead and just keep walking. Right? If you fall off the cliff, we will catch you and put you back up. And then you can go ahead and decide how to handle that situation. Right? Uh, and uh, if an exception is thrown, if or when an exception or error is thrown, uh, and we do use the keyword throw. I'll go ahead and add N at the end so to be grammatically correct. Uh, if, uh, if and when an exception is thrown, uh, control flow uh, goes to the first or most appropriate catch block in which you can decide how to handle the exception. How you choose to handle the exception is completely up to you. Typically, exceptions are probably going to be fatal errors. If you expect a file to be on the file system and it's not there, well, the rest of the program was going to process with that file. If it doesn't exist, logically, can the rest of the program continue? No. Uh, if you need to connect to a database and you have no network connection and an exception occurs saying bad password or no network connection, can you reasonably recover from that situation? No. So generally, generally, you allow or want exceptions to be fatal, all right, to end the program. So in that case, how do you handle exceptions? Uh, you, can, you can provide some reasonable default handling code if you want, or you can print an error message and stack trace and exit, or you can ignore it, or you can rethrow it and let the JVM Java Virtual Machine handle it. All right? I like that last one. I call it catch and release. Uh, you know, if you're an angler, right, you catch the fish. Uh, you don't intend to eat it. It's just for, you know, because uh, you're having fun or whatever. Uh, and then you throw it back. I think that that's fallen out of favor, though. Uh, you know, if you're going to catch it, eat it. <laughs> uh, and then don't catch more than you can eat. Right? But anyway, we're going to catch and release. We're going to throw it. Right? Uh, these other, uh, these other uh, options here, you can provide some reasonable default handling. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're not reading a file, okay, that's fine. I'll go ahead and use a default data and then process this. Um, you can print an error message and a stack trace and then exit, right? Or you can ignore it. Okay, well, that's not, that's not a big deal. For example, uh, a lot of you have experienced when you run JUnit, for some reason, the latest uh, versions of uh, JUnit and uh, uh, Eclipse are not playing well. And so you'll still have all of your tests. They all pass or some of them fail or something like that. Many of you have all also observed a stack trace with a warning, right? And what do I do about this? Okay, ignore it, right? It wasn't fatal. Uh, it is just a warning, just move on, right? Uh, in fact, you can even silence it, okay? So let's go ahead and write some code here that demonstrate, say, each one of these possibilities. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a file. Uh, let's go ahead and create a couple of things here. Int n is equal to zero. Hint, I'm eventually going to divide by zero and to force an error to happen, an arithmetic exception. Uh, I'm going to also create a file here. F is equal to new file uh, data slash foo.txt. That is a file that does not exist. I'm going to force uh, an exception here because like a file IO exception, a file not found exception. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and try a couple of dangerous things here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to try is opening it up with a scanner. 
Ah. The second thing I'm going to do is try to, say, read uh, the first line and then parse that first line as an integer. Uh, so uh, int n or int x is equal to uh, s dot next int. There we go. I'll just do it like this. Actually, no. Let's go ahead and read it in as a string. Line one is equal to s dot next line. There we go. And then instead of calling the next line here, I'll go ahead and call integer dot parse int. Uh, line one, there we go. And then I'm going to try to divide x by n. Int c is equal to x divided by n. First of all, is that a compiler error? Nope. Uh, it sees that initially it was zero, so it might be able to guess that you're gonna divide by zero, but it's not that sophisticated. It's just going to assume maybe it was changed somewhere between the declaration and the, uh, uh, the, the division by zero here, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to catch some exceptions. The file not found exception, we're familiar with that already. Uh, file not found exception E, I'll call it E. All right. And then I, you, what we had before was E.print stack trace. Right. You can also go ahead and exit at this point, system.exit with an error code. Didn't find, the, didn't find it, right? And this file does not exist, so if I were to try to do this, of course, I would get that file not found exception no such directory, right? I didn't need to exit. I could have done something else, right? To do, do something else, right? Or you can exit, right? If I refuse to exit, then I can come down here. Then normal control flow will continue after this try catch block. So system.out.println end program, right? Even though an error happened, my choice was just to print out the stack trace and then continue. So we'll see that in action here, that we got the error message. I printed out the stack trace. It is all in red because it's in the standard error. But at the end of the day, I went all ahead with the rest of the program. I moved on, right? It caught me, it put me back up on the cliff, and then I continued walking maybe in a different direction. Uh, if you wanted to exit, then you could go ahead and do that too. And there, the end program won't even print. Right? Because what happens? We jump down here upon the er uh, error, we print out our stack trace and then we quit out of the entire program. Right? Uh, alternatively, you could, you know, you could uh, go into a loop and okay, we'll try file foo, uh, f try file bar, try file baz, right? You could do something like that if you really wanted to. Uh, gross, right? Or what you could do uh, is entirely is catch and release. So. All right, fine, you, uh, file not found exception. I'm just going to go ahead and throw a new runtime exception, wrapping up that exception and then throwing it back to the JVM. Now, if something up higher decides that they wanna handle this kind of exception, that's their, that's their business, right? Uh, whatever, whatever function called this function, called this function, called this function, that exception will get thrown up the stack trace until somebody either decides to handle it in a catch block, or it gets all the way up to the beginning of the Java virtual machine invocation and it dies. In this case, it'll just die. It will, oops, I didn't save. There we go. In this case, it will die, but with a different type of exception, a runtime exception that encapsulates a file not found exception, preserving the stack trace and preserving the, uh, the original message. Now, why would you wanna do something like this? Because a lot of times you have to. Remember how I started out, uh, started this out? Let me go ahead and just go ahead and use this. Get rid of this. What if I didn't want to do any exception handling at all? I don't care. It's fatal. Right? If, you get, if you can't open that file, then there's nothing I can do. Right? End the program. But Java is not letting me do that. Java is looking at this. It's called a checked exception. In other words, the Java folks way back in the beginning, they decided it was a good idea to implement exceptions that force the user, in other words, you programmers, uh, to actually tr surround it with a try and catch. They, th you know, what is it now? 25 years ago, they thought this was a good idea. Right? It was not a good idea. And in the intervening 25 years, everybody has seen that it's not a good idea and no other language has adopted this stupid feature. Right? But we're still living with the, the consequences of their decision 25 years ago, where we have to surround this with a try catch. Right? The whole point of error handling is 
you get to decide how to handle it. One of your options is, I don't care, right? I don't want to handle it. By forcing you to handle it, they've taken away a little bit of your, uh, your decision process, a little bit of your flexibility, right? So the way that you can take that <laughs> agency back is by simply saying, all right, well, fine, I have to catch it, but I don't have to do anything with it. I'm going to rethrow it. And a runtime exception is an unchecked exception, an exception that does not have to be surrounded with a try catch. They at least gave us that much 25 years ago. There were two types of exceptions, uh, checked exceptions, unchecked exceptions. You are forced to surround it with a try catch. Try catch is optional. So I'm going to take this thing that is forcing me to do something one way, and I'm going to turn it into a different way, forcing me not, uh, now I'm not forced to do anything about it. Right? Now it's just going to be fatal. Like it was before. Yeah. So if you use that throw command that's not in a try catch, what happens? You can still do it. Uh, so if, for example, my denominator here, n, n is equal to zero, I'm about to divide by it. I could, I could program defensively. I, I could throw a new runtime exception with an error message. You cannot divide by zero, noob, or whatever. <laughs> And uh, I'll go ahead and get rid of this for now because I actually want to get down there. Uh, and we'll see that you cannot divide by a zero here. Right? <laughs> by throwing it, now, you could surround that with a try catch, but it's kind of pointless. But if you are in a function that is potentially doing something dangerous, you throw it back to the calling function, and then it, it, it's on you. you. You decide to handle it. If you decide to handle it, you decide how to handle it but you can throw runtime exceptions. You can even make your own exceptions, but we're not gonna go that far. I'll go ahead and keep this down here though. Restore this and show you that the same block of code here could issue more than one type of exception. So for example, let's go ahead and change this to, what was the other file? Uh, okay, let me get rid of four for a second to demonstrate this. Let's go ahead and open up that file, that, uh, what was it, file.txt. Now, I'm no longer going to get this file not found exception because it does indeed exist. We created it. I'll get a different exception now. Uh, for the input string hello world, attempting to parse that as an integer is invalid, right? Uh, because hello world is not an integer. Well, what kind, of a form uh, what kind of exception was thrown? A number format exception. If you want to, you can catch multiple different exceptions. Catch a number format exception, and uh, you can use the same name, I believe, can you? No, yeah, you, you can. Uh, and then you can do it differently, all right? So, I don't know, uh, define a sensible default here. X is equal to 10 or something, right? Uh, define a default, if it makes sense. Otherwise, you can always rethrow it, right? It's all, you, it's all your choice, right? So, this will, this will take over if a file not found exception occurs. This will take over if a number format exception occurs. In this case, I'm not choosing to handle it at all. And so it'll just go down to end program, right? What happens is it gets thrown here. Nothing happens. I didn't print anything. I didn't handle anything. Okay, fine. Continuing. And then it continues down here to print end program. Right? Uh, now, if you don't know what type of exception could occur, you can have a generic exception exception. And then this one I will rethrow because I have no idea what it is. Right. Still ends a program. Why? Because I was specific in what I was doing. File not found exception, number format exception versus an exception exception. In other words, you go from the most specific to the most general. Because just like an if else if statement, the first one that matches is the one that gets executed. So the first one that matched here was number format exception, right? If I had a different file, then it would be a file not found exception, right? Uh, if I had the correct file, but uh, I don't know, restore this, right? Uh, but there was a bad formatting in the file, then I would get that number format exception. If I go back to the file and fix that error and put in four, right? Then I can go ahead and now no exception will occur, right? Oh, oh, except when I might divide by zero, right? There we go. What kind of uh, exception is that? An arithmetic exception, right? 
So you could catch, 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 catch as much as you want. Uh, now, this was the catch-all uh, that you cannot divide by zero here. I caught that right here, and I read through it as a runtime exception. You can add whatever code you want in here. And then there's also another construct here called finally. So try this dangerous stuff. If something happens, it'll get thrown, handle it here. What if you opened up a file successfully, like we did right here, but we never got to the point where we were going to close it? In other words, this division by zero exception occurred right here at line 29. It was jumped down here to this exception and it just re-threw it. Right. Now that's the end of the program, so it doesn't matter that much. But if we wanted to continue with our program and actually uh, print end program, then we need to handle it. Right. Uh, or if, uh, the, and we've got resources open. We've got this file that's still open. Did we get down to this line to close it? Nope. We divided by zero. It jumped down to this code block right here, skipping this, close, uh, this code block. In fact, I'll show you. Uh, if s dot is, what, uh, it's out of scope. Yep, okay. I'm gonna have to put it up here. S, there we go. S is equal to new scanner. If s dot is open, or dot get closed dot is open, dot open? No, what is it called? I thought it was is open or not. Maybe I can't even check it. Huh, okay, there's no way that I can check it. Maybe if there was something like this, is open, then I would print out that it's still open. But in any case, oh well, I can't do that. I can't show it to you, but just trust me, that file is still open. I still need to close it. So where can I close it now? S.close. And I don't have to put it up here anymore. If I use that original construct, by the way, the try with resources, then none of this would matter and I wouldn't have to even have a finally block. But now let's walk through this code, all right? So, oh, it was not compiling earlier. Maybe that was the issue, I'm not sure. Uh, S dot is quote dot is, nope, all right, I give up. Anyway, we've opened it up here. A division by zero arithmetic exception occurs here. We get thrown down here. And we throw this as a new runtime exception. But before we, uh, but I, I, I'm gonna cross my fingers here. I think that if you throw this, you might actually not end up going to the finally here. But in any case, uh, it, what, regardless of whether or not an error occurs or no error occurs, the finally block will always execute, ensuring that you're closing up your resources. This will come back to us later on when we work with databases. Because if you open up a database, that's a very expensive network connection that you're holding on to. And if a, an error occurs, like you query a table that doesn't exist, right? And an exception occurs, your program dies. That, that connection is still being held open. You need to make sure to, uh, to close it no matter what. If there's an error, if there's not an error, if there are 50 errors, no matter what, you need to close that connection. Otherwise, it'll be left open. Uh, and then you'll be sitting there for five minutes waiting for it, the, the server to automatically close it because you haven't talked to it for five minutes. Right. All right. I'm not able to do this because it's probably not in scope. What, what what, uh, might not have been initialized. Fine. Uh, who cares? Uh, all right. I'll just put this in as a comment. Okay. I'll make sure that you have this in the notes, though. Right. Any questions so far? Otherwise, that's error handling. Uh, what we need, still need to do with, as far as Java goes, is searching and sorting, right? and doing it properly, and then class, uh, or creating and designing, or designing and creating, I guess you should say, classes. Right? And that's where we'll pick it up next week. Uh, but just as a preview here, searching and sorting, what are you gonna wanna do? So Q, remember Q sort, right? You've got an array. Do you write your own sorting algorithm? No, what do you do? You call a standard sorting algorithm. But the sorting algorithm, how do you want it ordered? You want it in an order in ascending order, descending order? Are they integers? Are they doubles? Are uh, they students? Do you want to order them last name, first name, or do you want to order them by GPA, et cetera, et cetera? 
what's the other component that you need to give to that sorting algorithm to determine that? A comparator. In C, a comparator is a function pointer. In Java, a comparator is actually a full class. And that's what we'll be doing on Tuesday. All right, have a good weekend.